Let's bring in Leo Hendry uh, to talk about our debt and to talk about his thoughts. And this comes with his background uh, in support of a number of years ago of John Edwards' effort uh, towards the uh, a presidency. Um, I, I want to talk to you more than anything about infrastructure. You've thought about this. You've studied it. We're miles away from a plan to rebuild America. You know, we're miles away from, from a jobs initiative, Tom. I think that's the, that, that's the fundamental issue today. In, in all of this sturm and drang around the, debt, the deficit and the ceiling and, and that debate, I was down there all of Thursday and Friday. And if we did a jobs impact statement on any of these discussions, we would find that as proffered, most of these plans, in fact, will cut further jobs. You, when you cut spending at the government level, right. There's a ripple effect into the medium term. And one of the initiatives that we have focused on for years is when we saw that the, the, this economy starting to really wheeze, which was as early as mid-2006, and you and I have been on, on some of your radio shows and talked about it, the, the most immediate macro fix is to address the infrastructure crisis in America. We certainly have about 5 million youth that need to be attended to in the unemployment numbers, but the macro fix is infrastructure. We, we've got something on the order of $3 trillion of decrepit well, uh, infrastructure. Somebody's doing it. Look at this chart here, dreaded first chart. You can see it down here, Leo. Caterpillar, folks, infrastructure booms abroad. We have people like Caterpillar. I would suggest we have service industries that can put construction people to work. We have the infrastructure to assist infrastructure, except we're helping people spending money abroad. You see that in the <clears throat> Caterpillar price. What you see it in the Caterpillar price, you see it in all of our hard equipment suppliers. There is no political will around this issue that's cohesive in an intellectual sense, Tom, that'll produce the results we want. Some in Washington talk about an infrastructure bank. We certainly are a major advocate of the National Infrastructure Bank. But is it a, is it a leveraged bank, Tom, or is it just a, a small series of block grants? It has to be something very substantial. Something Why can't we think big? Well, th there are women and men who are thinking very big. Rosa DeLauro, the congresswoman from Connecticut, has put this bill through every year since 1994. John Kerry has picked up the mantle in the Senate from Chris Dodd. But when we get to the White House, and I, I say this with, with respect, Tim Geithner thinks that the only banks that there should be in this country are his Wall Street banks. And so the concept of a national infrastructure bank is finding a lot of resistance, not from the president, but from his economic advisors. Is it because it's bureaucracy? Is it because of politics where they can't get elected? An infrastructure bank doesn't seem 1930s to me. It seems almost military industrial complex 1950s, 1960s. We've done this before in the well, space program and others. Well, we've done it before, but then uh, we did it to great effect before, Tom. We watched that bridge fall in Minneapolis and get rebuilt with Chinese steel. A huge story in the New York Times three and a half weeks ago about the bridge in the San Francisco Bay that is being done with Chinese steel. So you, you need three things. You need, you need a bank charter. You need it to have private capital be part of its capital structure. Right. Okay. It has to be a leveraged institution so that it's a moment. It has to be of, of size. And it has to be accompanied with what every other nation in the G20 has but ourselves, which is by domestic. You can't repair government infrastructure, whether it be the bridges here in New York, the bridge at bridge in Minneapolis or the one in San Francisco, and then do it with Chinese right. steel. Here's a quote here from a research report. The task force on job creation, uh, rather than bring all the natural resources to bear on the job crisis, the White House has addressed the interlocking variables in separate stovepipes. I like that, separate stovepipes. Do you mean just the ability to think little and discreet? You know, uh, that, that quote comes from a report that we released on Friday called Task Force on Jobs. It was 20 of the most amazing women and men in Washington, labor leaders, po uh, political leaders, and, and, and academicians. And it was all about creating jobs. And what we were concerned about is if you take this what's called a stovepipe approach, everything is vertical and nothing is integrated, Tom. And, and I think the fundamental failing, and you said it in your lead a minute ago, was we don't have uniquely and I say that uniquely among the G20, we don't have our own manufacturing policy. Right. If there was a policy, then the small and medium-sized enterprises here in this country would have found sustenance from the banks. But we, in fact, had financial reform, mm -hmm. and we gave nothing to the small and medium-sized enterprises, lending down 25%. Right. How many people, when you go down to Washington, have never met a payroll? 
What, fancy suits and ties and Chanel dresses, but they've never met a payroll like you've had to meet? Well, nobody in this administration's ever met one. Uh, cer certainly, you some took a shot at Tim Geithner. <clears throat> well, but, uh, but maybe you know, he never but... has. And and what what you what you have is a disconnect underway that that's acute. It's a chasm now, Tom, between those of us who believe that the best thing for this economy will always be the vibrant middle class, the, f the near full employment, and and this sort of deficit driven top-down approach, the uh, trickle-down approach that has been so discredited mm -hmm. over the years. And it's a war now. And I think the tragedy of where we find ourselves is I thought coming out of the 08 campaign, there was a common agenda, which was jobs, and there was a common enemy, which was the banks. I, I think we've largely forsaken both of those. Here's a chart, national savings. This is an ugly chart, folks. We've shown it before. It's a long-term view, the dearth of national savings. This is combined savings as a percent of our gross national income. And you can see it, the chronic sense to this, this overlays this debt ceiling debate. When you take our deficit, when you take good corporate savings, when you take okay private savings, we're now way below zero. We've come back a little bit, but we got a long way to go to be like Germany, to be like Switzerland and other nations. Well, the, let's take the German example, Tom. Germany has around 24% of its employees in manufacturing. We have 8 to 9%. I like that number. And you can't survive with a number of 8 or 9% in manufacturing without living from credit bubble to credit bubble. When, when, the, when the service sectors are disproportionately large, economies sustain only with credit bubbles. Mm -hmm. So the, the chart that we saw a moment ago, which is this, you called it the dearth of savings. Of course there's a dearth of savings. There's 18.5% eight, real unemployment. It's 9.2% official, right. but it's 18.5% real. So where is consumption going to come from? Where are savings going to come from? Somebody that would push back against you. Let's bring it up here, folks. Bloomberg View, we're eclectic. Here is Congressman Paul from Texas, the doctor default now or suffer a more expensive crisis. Higher borrowing costs will ensure the government cannot continue the same old spending. Now, I bring this up in good spirit. And, and that is, there's a lot of people there are so distrustful of the system, and it's that same middle class looking to Ron Paul as they may look to Leo Henry. How do we get back that trust that you and Congressman Paul are looking for? Well, I, I had the pleasure of advising both candidates, both Edwards and Obama in 08, on economic and trade and jobs issues, Tom. And I kept saying, you, you should preface these speeches by saying, I'm not talking about the government that made you stand in a DMV line for three or four hours. I have to reform government. So when, when, when Congressman and, and, and Senator Paul, now both he and his father, raise these issues, on, on, the, on balance, they're correct. The reality is they're painful. And what we have to realize is if we go anywhere near these deficit cutting plans that are on the table now without responsible raises on the revenue side, we'll actually lose 1.8 million more jobs on the last Boehner plan in the medium term. What now, ratio would you put on spending and revenue rise? Well, I, I had hoped it was 50-50, Tom. I'll take 60-40. I'll take anything that's not 100-0. Right now, the, the Boehner-McConnell school would say 100-0. Well, you can't. You cannot have these two wars going on, this distress in the economy, and not address the revenue side of our economy. And what I, I've always said is that there are some of us, and I'm one of them, the wealthy in this country right now and certain corporations are disproportionately not paying their fair share of taxes. I'm one of them. And if we don't address the revenue side responsibly while we address the cut side, we will mm -hmm. genuinely lose, Tom, I, I, I can predict it with, with, with specificity, 1.8 million more jobs. We'll do the number later in the program, but CBO with a terrific note this week of 18% bringing what we bring in. And the spending is up there, and you have a constituency that so many Republicans represent. They're just exhausted by a trillion here deficit, a trillion there deficit. You, you just, by definition, you got to bring the spending down towards that tax level, even if you raise the tax level a little bit. I would suggest the ratio may have to be a little larger, spending cuts 70 or 80 percent versus taxes 20 or is that too much I think I think it's too much when, when you do the math Tom there's simply too many of us at the very top of of the income spread who are simply paying rates of tax I, I said to somebody in Washington on Friday here at the end of my career I'm paying a lesser rate of tax Tom than I did at the very start mm -hmm. to be frank I pay a lesser rate of tax than you and the women and men around us today are paying that's not fair 
It, 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 we have set a system up now for 30 years under the premise of trickle down, and I, I'm, I've had a very privileged career. I, I've earned my wealth, I, I assure you. Anybody that works for the New York Yankees has not earned their <laughs> wealth. I, so from Red Sox Nation, I, I can tell you that. I was 6'4 when that project started and got beat down. But let, let me finish that point. I, I, ha I am blessed in my, in my personal wealth. If you make me wealthier, do I really create jobs? So mm -hmm. few of us have the wherewithal as individuals to create jobs. You just make us wealthier, Tom. We right. don't buy a thing. Is it a gilded age? Oh, gosh, yes. It's the worst since 1928 by every statistic. Every statistic mm -hmm. says more income inequality than it's since 1928. One of the smart notes of the morning, David Kotak, Cumberland Advisors, note of the day. There it is. I love this. Forget about the gang of four. The gang of 535 plus two U.S. stock market ETF portfolios remain fully invested. We are overweight financials for the first time in years. As for our politicians, they can go soak their heads in a bucket of ice water. Can the markets maintain and be good if the politicians are so dysfunctional in Washington? Can they be discreet? No. That, that, that we now know. We, we, we now know that this herky-jerky partisan crap that's going on, pardon my French, Tom, in Washington, is, is, is actually now destroying our credibility. It's, it's not obvious to everybody right now, but if you take us vis-a-vis -vis a company, a country like Germany, where there's consistency and thoughtfulness and, 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 part, and, and bipartisanship. And the trains run, and, and they're the not rusted. Run, and the trains run. The whole now, rusted thing, I just don't get. Oh, I don't get it all, particularly when it's such a job creator of a moment. Chart. This is the Leo Hendry chart. To get you upset, folks, slope matters. It's logarithmic, which means the slope matters. Percentage change. Growth in investment has disappeared. This is investment of GDP, and you can see it's been the 10 lost years here. How did that happen? How did we just have investment <clears throat> go flat? Too high of taxes? Well, part of it is structural in that we have an accounting system that's all income and, and, and expense and, and not a balance sheet. That bridge that you and I talk about in Minneapolis is on nobody's balance sheet, yet it would be on any company's balance right. sheet. So when we try to advance these funds, which is why we have suggested this, this semi-government, semi-private national infrastructure mm -hmm. bank, which would find the preponderance of its funding from the private sector, mostly the pension funds, that has to be the solution because intellectually we're not ready to, for that three trillion of expenditure that we need to make to get our com com competitiveness back, Tom. Thank you. Interesting conversation as always. Leo Hendry, Intermediate Partners.